chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice. He shed his sinless, spotless blood on the cross of Calvary. And I don't know about you, but I just love the name of Jesus. There's something powerful about the name of Jesus because at the name of Jesus, there's healing. At the mention of the name of Jesus, the demons in hell fear and tremble. At the mention of the name of Jesus, sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus. Lives are changed because of the name of Jesus. So this choir here in just a moment is going to be asking you a question. What do you think about Jesus? Well, to me, he's all right. Amen. Our God is all right. He is all powerful. He is able to do exceeding and abundant above all that we could ever ask or think. Hallelujah. Well, he's all over me and he's keeping me alive.
was getting on Facebook this afternoon, and as I always do, I wanted to check up and, and see what the latest gossip, I mean, see what the latest news was. And uh, as I got on there, uh, Facebook memories, I guess it likes to keep up with the things that you post throughout the years. And on August 29th, 2010, I posted a scripture of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, that says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And in that Facebook quote, I was talking about basically what I was preaching on this morning, about people having a desire but not willing to make the sacrifice. There's a lot of people that say, well, I want to see God do a great and mighty work. I want to see God grow this church. I want to see God pour out a revival upon this community, but yet we don't want to spend the time and prayer that it takes to see that revival come to pass. And when a revival service is scheduled, then we just rely upon the visitors that are coming into town to come, and then all the home folks stay home. I know that hits home sometimes, but that's the way it is. Sometimes we have the desire, but we're not willing to make the sacrifice. And I saw that this afternoon, and it reminded me that that is the text that I'm preaching from tonight. I had no idea what I had wrote on Facebook in 2010, but I believe this was a check from the Holy Spirit to confirm the message that I am preaching on this evening. So if you have your Bible, I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. The Bible says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Tonight I want to preach to you on the subject, and I'm calling the title of this message, Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. How many times do we pray and we take all of our prayer time talking to God, but yet we never allow any of that prayer time for God to talk to us? We tell God about our problems. We tell him about our sickness, about our pain and our physical suffering. We tell him about other people's problems and what other people are doing to us. And we ask him to take care of it. And we ask him to help us overcome the difficulties. And then we say in Jesus name, amen. And we leave and the prayer is over with. The conversation was a one way conversation. And we did not allow God to speak back to us. We did not wait in his presence. We did not linger and pray in the Holy Spirit. We did not wait for God to show us what we need to do. And then we began to wonder, is God really listening to me? In reality, we're asking the wrong question. It is not a question on whether or not God is listening to us. But are we listening to God? Are we listening to God? Every time we go to God in prayer, I assure you, he hears every word that we pray. But the question is, do we hear every word that he says to us? Does everyone in the church hear every word that God is speaking to us? God speaks to us in prayer. And there may be times when, when God, or it may seem that God does not hear us, but it's because we, our prayer is meaning nothing to him because it was not genuine. It was not real. It was not from the heart, so to speak. And so therefore he might as well not listen. Why? It's because in, in Psalms chapter 66, verse 18, he says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That means if I pray, but yet I have the intention to keep living in sin. If I pray and plan to do something out of the will of God, I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting God's time. I'm wasting everyone else's time. And our prayer is going to be ineffective. See, we've got to pray according to the will of God. We've got to be willing to submit ourselves to God's will, to submit ourselves to the word of God. 
But when we are true to the Lord, when we are true to his ways, he is going to hear us when we pray. If we have repented of our sin and we have truly committed our lives to serving him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our life, we don't have to wonder if God hears us because he does. We don't have to wonder if God is listening and if he is concerned about our circumstance because he is. And if we are harboring sin in our life, then God is not going to give ear to our prayer. But if we have repented and if we have committed our life to him, then church, there is no obstacle. There is nothing in this world that can block your prayer from reaching the very throne of God. In Psalms chapter 40, verse 1 through 3, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. We know that if we are in tune with God, he hears us when we pray and God is going to speak back into our life. You see, prayer is a conversation. It is a conversation between a human being and God Almighty. A conversation includes more than one person speaking. If there is only one person that is doing the talking, either that individual is talking to themselves or they are lecturing another individual. Now concerning prayer, we certainly do not need to lecture God. God is all-knowing. He knows all about the circumstance. Therefore, we must listen to him and wait for him to speak back into our life. There have been times that I have talked with people, or rather I should say listen to some people who were talking, and they would talk for about 45 minutes about everything and about everybody, and they were talking about everything they were experiencing in life, and every so often I might be able to say, yes, uh-huh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand, and, and the conversation would go on for about 45 minutes, and I wasn't able to get a word in edgewise, and then they say, well, it's good talking with you, I'll see you next time, goodbye and they're gone. That wasn't a conversation. They was just unloading everything to me and I guess I was a good listener. They did all of the talking. I didn't have a chance to say a single word. But a good conversation means both people are talking to each other. There is communication. There is understanding between both parties. And likewise, our prayer to God needs to be the same way. We take our needs to the Lord, and then we need to allow the Lord to speak back into our life and wait in his presence. And we praise him while we are waiting. And the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to us. He will speak to us in our mind or he will speak to us as he prays through us as we begin to pray in the spirit. But the whole purpose is to simply wait on the Lord and allow him to speak to us. While God does speak to us as we pray, he also speaks to us through his written word. The reason there is so much confusion in people's lives and even confusion in some church ministries today is because people have not listened to God. God has given us every single thing that we need to know in his written word. And there's nothing new that needs to be said. There's nothing new that this world needs to know. And so that means every time there is a message in tongues and an interpretation, every time there is a word of knowledge and wisdom, it's going to be in complete harmony with what is already written down in the word of God. Every time someone gives a word of prophecy, it's going to be in complete harmony with what is written in God's word. And so that tells me that if someone prophesies and it contradicts the Bible, they're a false prophet. If someone prophesies that something is going to take place and it does not take place, that means they are a false prophet. So the gift of prophecy is not to prophesy over future events in our life. You see, there are prophecies in the Word of God that talk about future events for a reason because they are given to show us the times in which we are living. And those end time prophecies, as we call them, they have a purpose and a place, and that is to remind people that time is of the essence and that we must repent before it is too late. I am very skeptical of those who profess to give 
personal prophetic messages regarding, regarding the gaining of material wealth. See, the main reason is because that is not what the gift of prophecy is to be used for. The gifts of the Spirit come from the Holy Spirit. And in order to understand the, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit regarding prophecy, we need to understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the one who gives these spiritual gifts. During his ministry, Jesus taught the disciples about the coming of the Holy Ghost and, and what the Holy Ghost would accomplish in and through their lives. In John chapter 16, verse 7 through 14, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of unrighteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The purpose of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to point people to Jesus Christ, to lead humanity into the truth of God's Word. And so then we come to the book of the Holy Ghost. The book of the Holy Ghost is the Word of God, the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so the Bible as we have it today, the, the inspired, the infallible, the inerrant, ever-living seed of God's Word, it was written and penned by mankind, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit as He moved upon them, and they wrote according to what God instructed them to write. And so that means that the purpose of the Bible is to point people to Jesus Christ. It's the book of the Holy Ghost. And so since the Holy Ghost points people to Christ and the Bible, the book of the Holy Ghost points people to Christ, then every gift of the Spirit, including prophecy, must be done in order to point people to Jesus Christ. And so when we're waiting on the Lord and we allow God to speak into our life, not only does He speak to us, but we are also going to renew our strength. As a child of God, we need to recognize that the Lord is the source of our strength and He is the strength of our life. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the Word of God says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We do not have to rely upon our own strength. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our strength. He gives us the ability to do what He calls us to do. He empowers us physically. He empowers us spiritually spiritually. He empowers us in our mind mentally. And if we face sadness in our life, we can still remain strong in him. Why? Because Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so that tells us regardless of what we face, regardless of the difficulties, whether we're facing sickness, we're going through pain, we're going through every storm of life, we're going through everything in this world. When the enemy comes in like a flood, we can still remain strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In Psalms chapter 27 verse 1 through 3, the psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, and then this will I be confident. There may have been times in the past when we were strong in the Lord. And through the course of time, maybe we have drifted. A lot of times when we get away from the source of our strength, we begin to lose our strength. It's difficult to stand when you don't have any strength. 
It's difficult to keep on going when you do not have any strength. Let me relate this spiritual principle in a physical way. There were times on Sunday evenings by the end of the day that, to be quite honest with you, I'm just wore out. I'm tired. I'm ready to call it a day. I have nothing left. My, my, my vocal cords are shot and I, I can't sing. I can't speak. I show up to work on Monday morning sometimes and everyone thinks I'm sick. I need to stay home because I literally sound like I have bronchitis because it sounds like a massive frog in my throat. I can sing bass very well. I could sound like J.D. Sumter or even like some of the other bass singers. See, it's difficult to continue when you're tired. It's hard to talk when the vocal cords have lost their strength. But when a body is weak, when a body is tired from working all long, all day long, all a body has to do is just sit down and rest. And over the course of maybe six to eight hours overnight, there is something that happens. Strength is restored. New energy is given. See, it's the same way in our prayer life as we pray and as we wait upon the Lord. He is going to refresh us. He's going to strengthen us. And we're going to receive a refreshing of his anointing, a refreshing of his power. We're going to receive new energy to continue to carry on the spiritual task that is set before us. See, this is a principle that Jesus taught his disciples concerning those who were tired and weary spiritually. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, the devil lacks nothing more than to see a child of God begin to become discouraged and tired and then give up. Sometimes it is discouraging when we see others who have been in the family of faith for many years and they begin to drift away and they get out of tune of the will of God. Sometimes the people of God are attacked with physical sickness and it begins to get discouraging and the enemy does not like the mission of the church and so he's doing everything he can to try to stop the church by attacking those who serve on the front lines of ministry. If you say it cannot happen here, you better think again because it is happening right here. It's happening right here. The lady who is over, I'm not going to, since our services are being broadcast online for their privacy, I'm not going to give their names, but the lady who is over our prayer ministry has been diagnosed with cancer and she's going through cancer treatments right now. The enemy has been trying to put an attack upon her and she's unable to be here in service. And so we put someone else that was going to be over our prayer ministry. And now the enemy has attacked her with severe sickness. And she's in the hospital this very moment and, and is in the emergency room because of severe sickness and, and, and illness that's over trying to overtake her body. We have others in our church that have been experiencing sickness. Others that are going through circumstances in their family. Why? Because the devil's trying to stop the church. But I need to remind the church, I need to remind the devil too, that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The enemy may do what he wants to. He may come in like a flood, but the Spirit of God is going to raise a standard up against it. And if God be for us, who can be against us? There's still power power in the name of Jesus. He has power over sickness. He has power over cancer. He has power over division and families. Let the enemy come in, but Jesus will destroy him. He is defeated in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So don't be afraid. God is going to give us strength. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That lets us know that the Lord is going to give us strength through the power of the Holy Holy Spirit. He is going to strengthen us physically. He's going to strengthen us spiritually. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. As we wait upon him and as he renews our strength. I like this part here. He says we're going to soar like the eagles. We're going to rise up above, fly like an eagle. Think about that for just a second. 
Has anyone ever seen an eagle fly? A few weeks ago, my wife and I was standing out here in the yard of the, the church parsonage, and we looked up. We saw two bald eagles circling around. They were way up there. At first, I thought, you know, that's a couple of vultures up there. But then I noticed the, the white head and the orange beak. You could see their feet. You could see the orange. You could see the, the brown. It was the, the bald eagles. And they were soaring up there high above all the other birds that was there. A lot of times, a bald eagle can fly up to 10,000 feet above the surface of the ground. They fly higher than all the other birds. In fact, there were some hang glider pilots in California that reported that they saw bald eagles flying above 15,000 feet above the ground. A lot of migrating eagles fly at speeds averaging 30 miles per hour, and sometimes they can fly as many as 225 miles in one day. A lot of times in our own frail humanity, we are limited on what we can see. We only see what is in our immediate surrounding. And it's also the same spiritually. We may not understand a circumstance. We may not understand why we continuously deal with the same thing over and over again. But then when we began to wait on the Lord, and when we began to receive his strength, he enables us not only to see our immediate surroundings, but he equips us to be able to see the bigger picture. We began to see life from a different perspective. We began to see our life through the eyes of God. We began to have an understanding of daily life when we see it from heaven's point of view. Brother and sister Carol and Priscilla Magruder, for many years, they pastored the First United Pentecostal Church in Kennett, Missouri. Sister Magruder had been diagnosed with cancer. And in the natural, it is hard to understand why someone who is so committed and dedicated to the service of the Lord would be dealing with such a sickness. But it was during this time that God began to deal with her. And throughout this healing process, God gave her the words to one of her songs. The words simply say, Today I faced a mountain that I have no strength to climb. And the struggle of the journey left me weak, both in body and in mind. From where I stand to the peak is a distance on my own I cannot reach. So this journey of a thousand steps begins right here on my, on my knees. I may face things tomorrow that I cannot comprehend today. Circumstances so uncertain often make it hard to find the strength to pray. But I am living in his promise. I'll never leave you. I'll always see you through. So what is this mountain to an eagle that is flying high from heaven's point of view? Soon I will soar like an eagle, high on wings of love. Far into the heavens, I can almost see God's face rising in his splendor to heights I never knew. What once looked like a mountain is just a hill from heaven's point of view. Some time ago, back in 2010, I had gone to Los Angeles to minister with some other pastors on the streets of L.A. And as we were traveling back, I, I had a window seat, and I, I love to fly at a window seat so I can see all of the, the sights. And flying from California, we had a layover uh, on the tarmac at, at Las Vegas. I didn't get off the plane there, by the way, just so you'll know. I want to set that straight. But we were flying from Los Angeles to Vegas and then was going to stay on the same plane and come into Tulsa. But traveling from Los Angeles to Nevada, as the plane began to go up, the whole time while we were there in Los Angeles, I saw the mountains in the distance. And I could see mountains that literally makes Kavanaugh Hill look like a, a gopher hill. I mean, these are big mountains. This is the world's tallest hill. I was seeing some of the country's tallest mountains. These mountains, and this was in the month of April, the half portion of those mountains were covered in snow. And the wind blowing off those mountains made it very cold there along the coast. 
But as I got on that plane and we began to climb up in altitude and go up above 30,000 feet, those mountains looked like anthills from above that airplane. And as we were flying over, it just looked like little specks of white down below. Why? Because we were looking at that mountain from a different perspective. We were rising up above it and it made what was once a very large mountain just seem like a little place. Just like in the, the book of Nehemiah where he says, Who art thou, O mountain? Before Jerubbabel, that, that mountain shall become a plain. The mountain shall become a plain. Why? Because we're looking at the mountain now from a different perspective. God has raised us up and he gives us a view of the whole picture. And what was once blocking our way, we're raised up above it to see, yes, there's a way around it. You can go this way. You can go that direction. You can get around this mountain. There is a way through the other side of this mountain. You see, when we wait on the Lord... We're going to run and not be weary. We're going to run and not be weary. When you wait in the presence of the Lord, he's going to anoint you to do more than you have ever done before. You're going to receive a second wind, so to speak, so that you can run the race that is set before you. Why? Because there is a destination that we must reach. There is still much more that we must do before reaching the end of the race because there's so many lives that depend on what a child of God does for the Lord Jesus Christ. Life is like a daily race. Sometimes in a race, the runner may get tired. There may be times in a race that the runner is tempted to quit and to throw in the towel and, and they begin to wonder, is it worth finishing the race? Is it worth to keep doing what I'm doing? Is anybody listening? Is anybody caring what I'm doing? Is it worth running this race? Is it worth running this race? You see, our Christian walk with God is the same way. There are times on our journey that we get discouraged. There are times on our journey that we get tired and we get weary. And there's times that we just don't feel like running anymore. But the Bible says if we wait on the Lord, he's going to give us fresh strength. He's going to enable us to run and not be weary. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, the Bible says... Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. The Apostle Paul was a man that had transformed completely. He recognized that he was nothing on his own, but it was the power of God that was working in him and through him. And Paul recognized that he had a race to run in life. And winning that race was only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There are people in this church congregation tonight, there are people who are watching online who serve in various areas of ministry. There were some who serve in children's ministry. There were others that serve in bus ministry. Some come here at the church on Saturdays and they spend time in prayer and they go out knocking on doors and inviting people to church. And then there were some that help in the music ministry and some serve in other areas. And in the natural, a lot of times we get tired. There may be times that we just don't feel like teaching Sunday school. There may be times that we just don't feel like playing our instrument or singing in the choir. There may be times that we just don't feel like worshiping. I've been there. You've been there. There's been times when I was driving a church bus and I just did not feel like getting up and getting down there and driving the bus, especially when it was 12 degrees outside. You just don't want to do it sometimes. But it's during those times that we begin to feel weak and we begin to feel the, 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 the weights of the flesh upon us. We need to remember to endure and remember that this is a calling that God has given us, that we have a race to run, that there are people that depend upon us, that God has given us a, a, a destination and a job to do. And we've got to run with all we've got and give it all we got because Jesus Christ is coming soon and we've got to do all that we can. Yeah. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, 
For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Due season is coming. For 10 years, I used to drive a bus in our bus ministry at Van Buren. And there was a time when I was doing literally quite a bit. I was driving the bus on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, and then I also drove the bus again on Friday night for a community outreach service. And then I spent all day on Saturday knocking on doors, inviting people to ride the bus to church. Also, I was teaching Sunday school. I was playing the organ for all the services and for choir rehearsal and sometimes singing in the choir when I wasn't on the organ. And oftentimes I was taking classes online and studying full time, working two jobs. Thank the Lord there came a time when I realized I can't do everything. But I had to focus on what I could do. I had to focus on where I could make a difference. See, it's like a kid one day, we've heard the story, he was walking down the shoreline, he was picking up starfish that had washed up on the shore and he was throwing them back in the water. Somebody was laughing at him and said, well, why are you doing that? You can't make a difference doing that. The kid said, well, that may be, but then again, maybe I am make a difference. He picked up another starfish, threw it back in the water and he said, it made a difference for that one. It made a difference for one. I told our visitation team yesterday, if we go out every Saturday of the year and only one new person comes to church and gets saved, it's worth every penny we have spent. We've spent almost nearly $1,000 for our upcoming revival and kids crusade coming up in the next couple of weeks. Why? Because we want to show these kids that we love them and we want to bless them and we want to give them and we want to make a difference in someone's life. And if only one person comes to know Jesus Christ, it's worth all the money in this world that you can spend. You cannot give enough to which God will not bless because you cannot outgive God. When you give unto him, he said, I will open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing. My prayer is, God, as we give unto you, as we pray unto you, as we wait for you to move, God, would you bless us? Would you pour out your spirit? Would you save a sinful soul? Would you feel a hungry heart? Would you feel a thirsty soul with the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name? Is it worth it all? I believe it is. I believe it is. There may be times that we get tired. There may be times that we're wondering, are we really making a difference? But the Bible says, don't be weary because due season is coming. On the dashboard of one of the church buses I drove on was an inscription that said, so many lives depend on what we do. Sunday school teachers, so many lives depend on what you do. Don't be weary because due season is coming. Church bus drivers, so many lives depend on what you do. Don't be weary. Due season is coming. Church ushers, many people depend on what you do. Don't be weary. Due season is coming. Musicians, choir members, video technician, maintenance workers, security personnel, don't be weary. Due season is coming. We will reap if we do not faint. We must wait on the Lord and he will strengthen us so that we do not get weary. Because if you will hold up, he will show up. When we wait on the Lord, he says we're going to walk and not faint. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew chapter 24, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Sometimes in life we've got to walk and keep on walking. Sometimes we've got to sing and keep on singing. We've got to work and keep on working. We've got to pray and keep on praying. And God has called each one of us in this church to serve in a particular way for such a time as this. You see, the task of evangelizing this world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ is not just the responsibility of pastors of churches. It's not just the responsibility of missionaries. It's not just the responsibility of evangelists. But it's every born-again, spirit-filled believer that has been commissioned with the task of carrying the gospel message. You see, to carry this gospel message does not mean that you're going to be standing behind a pulpit or, or even ministering inside the doors of a church building. Some people proclaim the gospel message by teaching Sunday school. 
Some people proclaim the gospel message by cleaning the church. Some people proclaim the gospel message by praying for other people. Others preach the gospel message by showing up on a Saturday to knock on doors and inviting people to church. Some people preach the gospel by preparing meals to feed hungry people on Wednesday night. Some people preach the gospel by driving a church van or a bus to bring people to church. Others preach the gospel by working a, a video camera so people around this world can hear the message that is preached in this worship service. Some people preach the gospel while they're at work on their job and they're living a godly life demonstrating Christian character. Some people preach the gospel when they keep a good attitude despite facing the very power of hell itself throughout the week. Some people preach the gospel by taking a, a, a box of food to a family that was in need. And we preach the gospel by ministering to children or working with youth. By, by caring for the church facilities, by, by mowing the church yard or brush hogging the, the, the church field. We, we preach the gospel by taking care of the church facilities, by, by taking care of the property that God has given us. So you see, these are all ways that people serve, and together we're working, fulfilling the great commission of Jesus Christ. When we pray and we wait on the Lord, He's going to give us the strength. He's going to give us the determination. He's going to give us the will to keep on going. And we must continue to work and we must continue to serve until Jesus comes again. He is coming very soon. Several years ago, it was in the, the mid-1990s when I first got involved working in outreach growing up and there was something that I noticed with our volunteer workers that really stuck out in my life and made an impact on me. When the volunteers from our church would gather each week to run our extensive bus ministry on Saturdays, we would begin the day with breakfast and prayer and devotion. 50 to 100 volunteers would show up each week to help with this outreach. And after prayer and devotion, this army of disciple makers would form a circle around the court of our gymnasium. We would join hands and we would say, we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Those words spoke to my mind, spoke to my heart, to my soul. The mission that we have set before us is not a part-time mission, but it's a full-time mission. It's a mission that we do not retire from. It's a mission that we keep doing until he calls us home. It's a mission that we keep doing until there's no soul that is left behind. See, why are we working until Jesus comes? It's because his, it's his command. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Church, that's why we're knocking on doors on Saturday. That's why we're running a van on Wednesday nights. That's why we're having a revival and a kids' crusade back to back. Why? Because we're doing everything we can. We're putting services on the internet. We have Facebook videos. We have Facebook advertisements where we're spending uh, uh, money on advertising and we're trying to do everything we can to get the gospel message out. Why? Because Jesus Christ is coming soon. We've got to let this world know before it's too late. See, as Jesus is coming for those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He is coming for those who have repented of their sins and have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. You see, coming to know Jesus Christ is very simple. There's some people today, you ask them, do you know who Jesus is? And they say, well, I go to church. I've been in Sunday school before. I went to kids' revival. But ask them if they know Jesus. It's not about whether or not you go to church. It's not about whether or not you, you've done this or that in the church. It's do you have Jesus Christ living within you? Do you have Jesus Christ living inside of your life? I've heard some that say, well, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I have Jesus living inside of me. 
I'm thinking, well, I think you would know if Jesus is living inside of your life. I guarantee it. If somebody was living in your house, you would know it. You would see the evidence of somebody living in your house. If Jesus Christ is living in your life, you're going to know because you will see the evidence. You will see the evidence of a godly character within your life. There's not a single person in this world that is perfect. The Bible says we've all sinned. In Romans 3.23, we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. That sin comes with a great price. Jesus has already paid the price for our sin. In Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. That was the whole reason that he came, to save people from their sins, to save people from their sins. Jesus wants to live inside of our life. He wants to dwell in our life to guide us into God's perfect will. Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 through 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation if you do not know Jesus Christ do not wait do not delay his coming is very soon and we must be ready we must be watching for he could come today he could come tomorrow he could come before the service is over search your heart ask the holy spirit to search your heart if there's anything in your life that would keep you out of the will of god give it to jesus take it to the lord in prayer and he will meet you can we stand together across the sanctuary